Hello and welcome to Jurist Book Club, a forum that bridges the gaps between ideas and the libraries, following a dialogue with the authors of new emerging research and scholarship, bringing those ideas to a global audience. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this interview with the author. Good evening, my name is Sukrut Khandekar. I'm a Jurist journalist, and today I have with me Mr. Ian Rosenberg. Ian has over 20 years of experience as a media lawyer and has worked as a legal counsel for ABC News since 2003. He graduated with distinction from the University of Wisconsin Madison and Magna Cum Laude from Cornell Law School. Ian began his legal career clerking in the Eastern District of New York and then working as a litigation associate at Cahill Gordon in Rindle. He's also an Emmy nominated documentary filmmaker and teaches media law at Brooklyn College. And well, the reason why we are here today is because he is the author of two books. First, The Fight for Free Speech, 10 Cases That Define Our First Amendment Freedoms. Yeah, there it is. Mm -hmm. And second, it's non-fiction graphic novel companion, The Free Speech Handbook. So Ian, first of all, heartiest congratulations on these books. And thank you so much for taking out the time to be with here today. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to talk with you and, and the jurist community. So, as I mentioned, uh, you teach media law at Brooklyn College, and you yourself are a practicing media lawyer. Yeah. So, before we proceed to talk about the books, I'm sure many people would be very interested to know what exactly a media lawyer does. So, could you perhaps tell us a little something about that? Sure. Um, well, basically, uh, I'm a lawyer concerned with uh, free speech issues. Um, I work at ABC News, and uh, so I work with journalists, producers, reporters, anchors every day, giving them advice on news gathering issues, such as hidden camera or investigations. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission is the American agency that regulates uh, broadcasting, and I'm an advisor on those issues. And then also uh, libel, so protecting against libel. Uh, my area of law can also be called pre-broadcast review because I'm working with the journalists before things go on air, giving them advice, reading their draft reports, um, being an additional uh, eye for accuracy and sort of uh, legal accountability. So it's a, it's a very uh, entertaining job uh, for a lawyer, and I'm really proud uh, to support the work of the fantastic journalists at ABC News. Great. So what I love the most about the book is that you've contextualized each chapter by first talking about a contemporary event, such as the National Student Workout or the Unite the Right March, and you've then proceeded to explore whether such demonstrations would be protected by the First Amendment by taking the readers all the way to a seminal Supreme Court judgment which dealt with a similar issue. And I think what is truly commendable is that you've managed to keep the book interesting for even someone who may not be from a legal background by humanizing these cases and successfully breaking away from legal jargon and Supreme Court doctrine to tell the readers about the stories behind the cases. So having said that, could you give us a general overview of the book? What is it about? Well, thank you. That's a, that's a, a beautiful description of the book and that's certainly uh, the goal I had when I wrote this. Uh, I wrote this book um, to be a, a guide, a user's guide to understanding free speech law in the United States, but I do think it also has uh, implications for free speech law throughout the world. And um, so many Americans over the last few years have been really clamoring to understand their free speech rights. People sort of proclaim that they have a right to free speech, but they don't necessarily know what that means. So as you um, nicely described, each chapter begins with a contemporary issue the ones you mentioned, in addition to does Colin Kaepernick have the right to engage in his take a knee protest, or um, can social media companies kick off the President of the United States? Uh, and each chapter then, as you uh, also nicely uh, capsulized, um, tells the story of people, or often ordinary people. Sometimes it's the, the New York Times or the President of the United States, but much of the time it is um, not famous American citizens who are fighting for a particular free speech right, and they get their fight um, all the way up to the United States Supreme Court that provides uh, answers not only for their case, but then for these contemporary issues that we're looking at. And I also appreciate that... Um, 
that you noted that the goal of this is, is not to be for lawyers, although lawyers can, I, I think, learn something from it too if you're not a First Amendment expert, but um, but this goal is to really just tell stories about very interesting people uh, who were passionate about their speech rights and how those rights really created greater protections for Americans of all kinds for the future. Right, and as you said, you meant it to be a guide for people who wanted to know more about the First Amendment. And what you managed to do really well is you've condensed legal jurisprudence without, as you said in one of your interviews, dumbing it down at all. Yes. So I think that uh, is... I, I, firmly, I firmly believe that, um, and I, I'm uh, paraphrasing this line from uh, the historian Timothy Snyder, um, that wisdom can be condensed. Uh, and then I sort of add on, um, as you say, without dumbing it down. So uh, th that is definitely one of my uh, main goals. Right. So since this interview is going to be seen by an international audience, could you start by explaining what the First Amendment is and why it is so important for the Americans? Yeah, so the First Amendment, uh, the, the, relative, the relevant uh, free press and, and free speech clause says that Congress uh, shall uh, not um, restrict uh, the freedom of speech or the freedom of the press. Um, and what that means is, uh, or actually the to quote it directly, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Um, and what that law has become to mean over time uh, is not just Congress, so not just the, in the American system, not just the federal government, um, but also um, state uh, government. So in the United States, we have both a federal and national system, as well as each individual state has their own laws um, and processes. Um, and so what um, the framers originally meant and what has been uh, become the law today is that the government and government actors um, are not allowed to restrict either the free speech rights or the free press rights of um, its citizens. Now, that's a pretty simple sentence or two, um, but what that has uh, come to mean over time has um, changed rather dramatically and expanded uh, in, in enormous ways. So uh, the book begins um, in the 1920s, which is really the beginning, even though uh, this is the first amendment to the United States Constitution that began um, with our country's founding, um, really until 1920, uh, the protections of the first amendment were essentially ignored. Um, and there's a lot of historical reasons for that that I, I don't get into, but a sort of modern free speech law begins with 1920. It begins with World War um, protests regarding World War I. Uh, and then, so this book starts from there, um, and although the contemporary issues that you refer to jump around, each um, case that we're talking about moves chronologically. So we go from uh, the 1920s to 2017 with the Supreme Court's um, most significant uh, discussion of social media uh, and free speech. Um, so we get a sort of sweep of the expansion and how uh, the free speech and free press protections have evolved uh, in, in America. Right. So uh, was there any specific incident that encouraged you to write this book? Yeah, so it's actually a personal uh, incident. So my um, kids at the time, um, I have two children, um, and at the time uh, they were uh, eight and 10 about, um, and they were both in school and they were very concerned um, about uh, gun violence and uh, people uh, even internationally may know about the, the tragedy of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, High School, which was yet another um, a school shooting uh, in our country. Uh, given the access uh, to guns that we have in, in America, unfortunately. And my kids both were interested in participating in what was called the, the National School Walkout, which was a student-led um, protest um, designed for students uh, to say that they sort of had enough um, with uh, government inaction to prevent uh, school shootings and, and to uh, promote sensible uh, gun uh, regulation. And so they both asked me, um, you know, what do we have? Do students have a free speech right? And what happens um, if we leave school without permission? And can we get in trouble? Uh, and I realized in, in talking with them, they're, they're, they're smart kids, but uh, I realized with talking with them that what we were saying before, that, you know, 20 years of my media law experience, um, I could convey the important concepts of the First Amendment and what was protected and what was not protected, even to, um, even to students, even to uh, younger kids. And I started to think that if I could do that, 
for them in a way that they started to understand that, uh, in fact, that there was not um, a book out there or a guide out there for them to turn to or for me to recommend to people. Uh, the, the novelist, Toni Morrison, has a wonderful uh, quote that I'm paraphrasing that says, if there's a book out there that you want to read uh, and you can't find it, you should write it yourself. Um, so I decided that sort of talking with them um, that, um, and also talking with the media law students I teach at Brooklyn College, who are graduate students in a basically um, communications and uh, radio and television program and, and emerging media program. Uh, and then also my conversations with journalists at ABC News. I I'm in an unusual legal role where I talk to people who aren't lawyers most of the time. Okay. Um, and so very smart people, but people who don't necessarily have a legal background. So all of these experiences and this realization that there wasn't a book out there that compared contemporary issues to the history of free speech law and that provided guidance, a sort of how-to to understanding your rights. Um, those were all the uh, incidents that sort of came together that encouraged me to write this book. Right. And just out of curiosity, what did you advise them about the workout? Well, uh, so I did, good question. So I did advise them that uh, students have um, free speech rights, and that's one of the chapters in the book. However, um, the, the right, as, as I'll, I'll, I'll get into that chapter, we could talk more about it, is basically you have a right to sort of non-disruptive um, protest at school. So you could wear an armband uh, or a t-shirt um, that would say, I support gun rights or, you know, uh, something, or could say, I support gun ownership. Either political viewpoint would be okay, but actually leading, leaving school would be disruptive, um, and they could be punished for that. However, they could not be punished more because they were leaving school for a political protest than they could if they were just leaving school to hang out with their friends. In other words, they can't be penalized for expressing a viewpoint that the administration may disagree with. Now, we live in New York City uh, in, a, in a very basically liberal, um, and, uh, and New York State has very uh, strong anti-gun laws, relatively strong anti-gun laws. So their um, worry was less about political retaliation, but other students across the country definitely had principals and administrators who sought to punish them, not just for leaving school, but because they disagreed with their message. So uh, I, I think this actually shows in many ways that you know, your rights are, um, you may have a right to free speech, students do have a right to protest, but then what I try and do in the book is, is break that down very specifically. So what does that mean you have an exact right to do? And, and freedom of speech also, one of the other themes of the book, is freedom of speech does not mean freedom from consequences. So you may have a right to say something, but then also you may have to suffer punishment or um, other um, negative consequences. The government can't necessarily restrict you, but other people uh, may react in, in a way that's harmful or, or, or disturbing. So that's another theme that runs throughout the book. Uh, they did, um, my son had a school um, run protest at, at my uh my daughter, uh, in, uh, older, um, left on, on her own. They, they did not suffer any uh, consequences. Okay, great. So, um, in the book, you take the readers through the American free speech jurisprudence using 10 landmark judgments. Yes. So, right from Abrams versus US, you go all the way to the 2017 judgment of Packingham v. North Carolina. So how do you manage to decide upon these 10 cases? Because I'm sure there's a lot of Supreme Court jurisprudence around the First Amendment. So how did you pick these 10 cases? Uh, uh, that, was, that was the fun part in, in many ways. Um, what I was looking to do was, was two main things. I really wanted this to be a book about contemporary questions that people had. Um, so I was always thinking about what is a controversy of today, sort of ripped from the headlines. What are people talking about right now? So there, there are a lot of interesting free speech issues that don't necessarily come up so often. So flag burning is a very interesting um, uh, American uh, free speech right, um, but it, it doesn't feel very contemporary. It sort of, sort of feels like uh, an issue of, of 40 years ago. So that's a great case that I decided not to do. Uh, so I wanted everything to tie to a contemporary question that people are asking about. Uh, the other thing that I always kept in mind was that I wanted 
uh, the answers to be as clear as possible. Um, and, and some areas, no matter, and so I, I work very hard to try and simplify things. There's a lot of uh, end notes in the book that you can read if you're an academic. Um, and and if, you're, if you're interested in a particular issue, you can find out other, other sources of information. But I really try to push that all to the side to keep the, the answers and the narrative as streamlined and clear as possible. And there are some areas that are not clear. Um, and, and you really sort of need to know a lot more about the law um, to, uh, to engage with issues. There's very interesting, another part of the First Amendment um, involves uh, freedom of, of religion, the free exercise uh, and the um, Establishment Clause, and the intersection uh, or the conflict between religious uh, liberties um, and free speech uh, liberties um, is, is actually a, an increasingly important issue in America, particularly with our increasingly uh, very conservative Supreme Court, but it's extraordinarily complicated, and to be honest, the Supreme Court is inconsistent uh, in the way they approach this. Um, and so I was looking to um, have contemporary issues and clear answers. Right, so you worked your way backwards. You looked at the contemporary issues and then you looked at what cases would be used to explore whether these, uh, you know, these restrictions or whether these issues are protected by First Amendment rights. That's right. Because I, I think sometimes people feel that history books, I like history, um, but I feel sometimes um, people feel like history is only for professors of history or, um, or you know, experts in that area. Uh, and what I wanted to show is that this history really um, has a lot to tell us about um, our law today. And also that these are just really great stories. These are um, that, you know, in law school, uh, as you know, you, you rarely get to dig in to the stories um, behind the cases. You have to learn a little bit about the facts to understand uh, the decision, but you don't really hear um, the, the narrative um, discussion of who these people are and, um, and, and what their legal journey uh, or free speech journey was about. And actually, even as a, a legal expert in the area, I did not know a lot of those stories. So that was, uh, that was the fun part to research yeah. and uh, that was the fun part to, to talk about too. All right. So um, while discussing the case of Abrams v. U.S., you call Justice Holmes' opinion the most important dissent in American history. Yes. So, what do you think is the significance of dissent opinions in developing future jurisprudence? Uh, that's a very good question. So, um, for people who don't know a lot about um, uh, American uh, law, or, or sort of, it's very similar to the British system as well, but, but that um, our Supreme Court, uh, there can be um, a majority uh, opinion, meaning this is the reason behind the decision, sort of the decision is who wins, um, and then the majority opinion is the explanation of the majority of the nine members of the Supreme Court um, explaining why this person wins or loses. Um, but a dissenting opinion is somebody who's voting in the minority. They don't agree with the decision, and they don't agree with the reasons behind the decision, and they are expressing that. And, um, you know, Justice, uh, the late uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a, was a famous uh, dissenter. I actually got into, when I was studying uh, law for the first time in, in college, um, I remember my professor who became uh, a mentor, uh, Professor Donald Downs, who's a free speech expert. Uh, on one of my exams, he, he said, you always write about the dissents. Why is that? And I, I find somebody sort of uh, arguing against the conventional wisdom um, very compelling. And so in, in the case you talk about, uh, Justice Holmes, we have these these World War One protesters. Molly uh, Steimer is one of them. She's an immigrant um, who becomes radicalized um, uh, and is a, an anarchist and opposes American um, incursion into uh, Russia during World War One. She throws some basically anti-war leaflets out windows. Uh, and factories right here uh, around this neighborhood I'm speaking to you from uh, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and uh, in New York. And uh, she's convicted basically um, for sedition um, and sentenced to 15 years in jail. Her, her male compatriot sentenced to 20 years. Their case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And even though they are just criticizing the government, which is a fundamental uh, free speech right today, um, their convictions are, are upheld. Uh, and Justice Holmes, uh, joined by his friend uh, Justice Brandeis, uh, for the first time sort of said that we cannot... Um, 
convict people uh, and sends them to jail just because we disagree with the, their message. And, and he comes up with this idea of the marketplace of ideas, very famous idea in American constitutional law that in short, the best test of truth is the power of an idea to get itself accepted in the marketplace. Now, he, he mentions this and it creates, a, a, as you mentioned, a, a revolution, a, a, a change in American law. And that is because even though this is his dissent, this was not what the law was at the time, Molly Steimer and her friends still went to jail um, and, and were later deported uh, to Russia. Um, this becomes the law eventually, and that's the nature of our sort of American and, and British common law system is that judges can change the law over time, even if the legal um, constitution or, or statute stay, um, that there's an evolving nature of the law. And that really comes about often through dissent. Dissent not only of individuals protesting against the government, but even the justices themselves sort of dissenting from the mainstream. Eventually, his um, model of free speech law, this, this marketplace of ideas model, is still quoted in the 2017 case uh, that you talked about uh, at the end of the book um, uh, in Packingham, uh, and that's because it now has become the law. The dissent um, becomes uh, the prevailing uh, wisdom. So it, it's, a, it's a way to teach people about how the law works, um, and it's also just... Um, sort of, I think, inspiring um, that even um, though you might be um, expressing your viewpoint um, to those who don't agree with you, that eventually uh, that can that can change the world. So um, in this book, you use this particular case that is Abrams v. U.S. in order to explore the women's marches, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Yeah. So uh, how exactly is this case significant for the women's marches? If you could uh, um, elaborate on that. Yeah, so I, I begin with um, Madonna, the Women's March, the first Women's March, and Madonna um, right after um, former President Trump was inaugurated, um, and uh, the pop singer Madonna um, speaking uh, to the crowd and saying, you know, I've thought an awful lot of blowing up the White House. And then she goes on in the next breath to say, but I know we have to choose love over hate. Um, and I talk about how, even though some political uh, Republican uh, commentators said that she should be, you know, looked into or, or put in jail for those remarks. Um, I talk uh, about how not only criticism of the government, but advocacy of illegal action um, is advocating for illegal action protected. Um, and that is what Molly Steimer, um, so I said we have to look back to the first key First Amendment case to answer that question. That's Molly Steimer, the Abrams case, and, and her friends. Um, and they were, there was a law that, that, that said you couldn't criticize the government and that you couldn't uh, advocate uh, against the draft, the World War One draft at the time. So what they were advocating for was technically illegal. Um, and, and both um, uh, Justice Holmes' dissent in, in terms of um, sort of big concept of we should protect dissenting viewpoints, we should protect even those views that we might find dangerous, um, that's one of the things that eventually changed in the law. And also his idea that basically only um, if there is um, a likelihood of bringing about uh, illegal action um, and that it is imminent um, to create illegal action should we be able to restrict speech. Um, and, and, and one of even speech that might um, advocate for um, for harm or legal activity. Um, and, you know, when I wrote that, I just thought it was a, a great connection between the most significant protest march in, you know, modern American history, um, you know, after the, the civil rights movement uh, of Dr. King, um, and, and this key First Amendment case from the past. But then it also, um, that, you know, took on greater revel uh, relevance uh, after the insurrection um, following uh, Joe Biden's election, President Biden's election, um, and um, you know people advocating uh, for illegal action um, at, at the Capitol and the, the attempt to take over uh, of the election results and, and Congress. So um, it, it, it takes on uh, even greater relevance, um, I think, to understanding what are the protections and limits of advocating for illegal action. And that's also what I hope that the book will continue to do for people, that even when I'm taking one particular uh, modern case, um, I think that will often, if you go, oh, this is sort of like this new thing that's happened since okay. the book is written, is sort of like that, 
this will give me a guide to what our our, our, our protections are in that area. Definitely. Uh, so also in the case of New York Times v. Sullivan, the court laid down the actual malice standard in order to determine whether a speech constitutes defamation. So don't you think that actual malice is a very broad concept? Because how exactly does one determine whether actual malice was present? It's a very subjective uh, you know, notion. So do you think there's a need to further define what this standard means? Well, uh, it's a... It's a good critique. Um, let me let me explain for for people who, uh, unlike you, who don't really understand what the actual malice uh, standard is. Let me explain it a little bit as I, I do in that chapter. So I begin that chapter with Trump and, and others saying that we have to change our libel laws. We have to change the actual malice standard. He doesn't really refer to it, but that's what he's talking about um, because. Journalists today can lie, they can knowingly lie and get away with it in this country, in America. That is not true. That is not what the law is. And, and what I then um, tell um, is the story of how we got the actual malice standard through Sullivan, as you were saying, and how perhaps surprisingly to many people, it actually involves Dr. Martin Luther King uh, and other civil rights activists uh, along with the New York Times, who were sued um, for libel. So this standard comes directly out of the civil rights movement. But um, So that's a, a very interesting story, I, I think, that I tell. But, um, but let me uh, talk about the standard to be, uh, to be brief. So um, actual malice means that the uh, journalists uh, can't lie and get away with it. Um, to show, um, uh, to win a libel judgment, in other words, a lawsuit suing uh, a journalist or anyone, but, but often journalists um, for getting something wrong, for saying something false. Uh, the actual malice standard says you can make small mistakes um, and still win. And that was necessary because there were small mistakes in this civil rights um, ad that had been taken out um, that criticized the Southern um, racists of, uh, of their era. Um, but actual malice says that you can't have knowing falsehoods or reckless disregard for the truth. So knowing falsehoods is really um, lying. You know that this is not true, but you're saying it anyway. Um, so you can't lie, and you also can't, reckless disregard for the truth is sort of, you can't turn a blind eye to the truth. So if, if somebody, you know, if you're accusing someone of something and they call you and they leave you a message and say, let me tell you why I didn't do it. Um, and you don't return their phone call. That, that you don't even listen to the message, or you, you don't bother to, to, to find out what their uh, their point of view is. That might be a reckless disregard for the truth. So, um, so yes, so that's what the standard is. Uh, and yes, it is not um, it's not clear cut. It is, it is arguably um, subjective. Um, but many legal standards are that way. I would say most legal standards, maybe even all legal standards, are that way. And the idea. Um, is that jury that that we can't find a way to say here are fifteen reasons um, uh, or fifteen points that a, a, a journalist must do every single time, otherwise uh, they should be able to be sued. Um, what um, what the standard intends to do is to provide a guideline of this is the type of protection that that journalists and, and speakers are generally protected unless they lie or really if you're talking about public figures is a is a different standard for private figures so public figures famous people um government officials uh celebrities um so if you're talking about public figures there's this very protective standard but it's also it's not blanket protection there were people on the court who said that journalists should always be protected um if they're criticizing public figures no matter even if they're lying uh, and Justice Brennan, who, who crafted and wrote the Sullivan decision, uh, didn't want to go that far. Um, he, he didn't want there to be a specific set of rules, and he didn't want there to be just sort of a blanket shield or, or a, a perfect shield. Um, and I think that this is the right balance. Um, I think that um, this gives us, gives the media uh, particularly, but also regular citizens who might be criticizing other officials, um, a lot of protection. But um, it does not. It does not enable you to to lie and get away with it. So it is. A, you're absolutely right. It is a subjective standard. But I actually think that even though that's a little bit harder to understand and a little bit less clear cut, I think it gives us both protection and flexibility. And how does this compare to the standard which was laid down in uh, Hustler Magazine, if all well, 
where there was something which was clearly untrue about a person in public light. But there was also a disclaimer which said that, you know, this is parody. So, um, even though it was clear to the audience that, well, what was written over there was not true, but again, it could have um, definitely effects on that individual's uh, reputation. So, how exactly do we compare the standard of saying something about a private individual to saying something about a celebrity or somebody in the public eye? Well, you, you raise a lot of interesting points there. Let me, let me uh, unpack them a little bit. Okay. So, you talk about, for, particularly for people who haven't read the book, so you, you talk about this uh, fantastically interesting case uh, of Hustler versus Falwell. And, and people, they were, at the time, two of the most polarizing um, and famous people in, in America now, a little bit less known. Um, uh, Larry Flint was the publisher of this very, um, well, pornographic, uh, to say the least, um, uh, magazine um, that also had cartoons and, and, and parodies and jokes in it, but, but mostly a, a, a dirty pornographic magazine. Uh, and Jerry Falwell was a, a far uh, right uh, religious uh, evangelical preacher who also became very active in, in politics. He founded what was called the Moral Majority in this country, which was arguably the first modern uh, evangelical Christian political action group of, of significance. They helped elect Ronald Reagan and, and really mobilized uh, Christian right uh, as a political force. So uh, Larry Flint um, publishes in, in, in Hustler, um, there was at the time a, a, a campaign, a, a, an advertising campaign for Campari, which was uh, a, you know, an aperitif, a, a liqueur, um, and they had these jokes about people talk about their first time. And, and the joke was that they were talking about the first time they had Campari, but it sounded like they were talking about the first time they had sex. They were real ads with real celebrities who were paid to do it. But then Hustler did a fake ad in the same style where they talk about, you know, jokingly, they talk about how uh, Larry Flint's first time was having Campari while having set, drunken sex with his mother in an outhouse, um, in a you know bathroom outside. Um, and uh, it's actually even worse than that. I, I won't go into the details, but yeah, the, there, there's a lot of more gross uh, elements to that. And, and uh, Larry Flint sues, excuse me, um, uh, Jerry Fal uh, Falwell sues Larry Flint um, and for what's called intentional infliction of emotional distress. Basically, um, you, you upset me and hurt me emotionally, but in a way that's so outrageous um, that it's beyond sort of acceptable notions of, of, of decency or, or, or of acceptability. Um, and he wins a small judgment, um, and the case goes up to the Supreme Court, and even though the conservative court of that time really found Larry Flint disgusting, and um, uh, and Jerry Falwell, some of the court, um, found him to be a, a revered figure, um, they were very concerned about um, political commentary. So political cartoons, um, or something like Saturday Night Live, you know, the, the satirical television show in, in America um, that makes fun of everyone. Um, and they were concerned, and that's how I begin the, the chapter, is Trump complaining about how can Saturday Night Live make fun of me and get away with it. Um, and it's because of this case. And so to wrap up, uh, and then I'll tie into your original question, um, the Supreme Court says we, if we let everyone who is upset just because they say something outrageous, just because a, a political artist or, or commentator or any kind of person engaging in satire um, is intending to be mean, because um, you're almost always intending to be mean when you're making fun of someone. You're not doing it maybe out of hate, but you still you're, you're making fun of them. Um, if we if we let anyone sue, then we will stifle um, political commentary. We will stifle satire uh, in a way that is unacceptable with the uh, with free speech. So they they add, they go back to the Sullivan standard and say basically you need to have. Sullivan level protections, meaning you need to show actual malice, um, knowing falsity, um, but you also so but you would this ad was false. So why doesn't why doesn't um, uh, uh, Jerry Falwell win? And, and the the sort of extra layer is that the court says that nobody could have believed that this uh, was actually trying to put forward something that is true. So uh, that you so you basically need. To, you get protected by the same standards uh, of, of actual malice 
if people at a first threshold believe what you're saying is not a joke. So if you're clearly joking, then uh, you're protected. Um, and now that's, that's, you're right, that's a subtle distinction. Um, but basically what the court did was they said, satire is essentially always protected. If there's any way in which you can believe that this is a joke and not, um, not a, a true statement, um, then you are protected because you need to have sort of uh, a factual, you can't have a, a false statement of fact if no one thinks you're actually saying a fact, if they just think you're saying a joke. So, um, so that is um, how the two standards sort of intersect. But what it did in this country um, is it basically permanently protected comedy. Uh, comedy, as you mentioned, there was a disclaimer in the ad that said this is a parody not to be taken lightly. So that was an, another way in which um, you could you could tell that they were joking. And, and Larry Flynn said nobody... If Namor was uh, absent in the particular case, then would the judgment have gone the other way? That's a good question. It, it certainly helps. Um, I, I, I don't think um, I don't think it's actually necessary because, as Larry uh, Flynn said in his testimony at trial, and I, I agree with, nobody is reading this ad, even though it looked like the regular ad and and, um, uh, and it had a, a real photo of him. Nobody's going to look at this ad and think. Jerry Falwell is a drunk, and Jerry Falwell is admitting to having sex with his mother in an outhouse. Hey. Um, it, it's only funny because it's so outrageous and shocking. Larry Flynn says, if this ad was about me, people might believe that I'm a drunk <laughs> and I had sex with my mother because people hate me and I, I, I publish a, uh, a, you know, a, a very a challenging slash offensive magazine. There's a lot of feminists who, who think it is you know, violence uh, against women, and there's a strong argument to be made for that. So he said, people might believe this about me. Um, they don't need a, a disclaimer to, to necessarily believe it about me, but nobody believes it about Jerry Falwell. Nobody went up to Jerry Falwell and said, this is true. People said, this is shocking. But nobody said, oh my gosh, is it true? So um, I don't think the disclaimer was necessary, but it definitely helped. Just like, and that's why political ads today or Saturday Night Live doesn't have to say, this is a joke. Below every sketch, every political cartoon you read in a newspaper doesn't have to say, not to be taken seriously. It's assumed in almost all contexts. So it certainly helped, um, but I don't think it's the decisive factor. It's an interesting question. To oversimplify this, I think we can say that the context in which you say something is very important. Absolutely. Yes. And in the context, if it's very clear that, you know, you're not telling the truth, then obviously you won't be penalized for it. But yeah, that's a good way of summarizing it. Yes. Yes. And, and I think context, you know, um, there's a lot of different themes that I try and weave throughout the book. And, and one of them is, um, and it doesn't get talked about a lot, so I'm glad you mentioned it. And one of them is how important context is. So why I'm telling these stories is not just because I think they make uh, great stories and, and are sort of interesting to hear the details, although I do, it's also to show how very much the same act in one context is absolutely protected and uh, the, uh, the, that same act in a different context is not. So in the Colin Kaepernick take a knee case, one of the, 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 the ironies that I point out is that since um, the NFL, the National Football League that Kaepernick used to work for, um, since they are a private company, they are allowed, actually, to restrict Kaepernick's dissenting message. I think it's wrong, and I disagree with them, and I think it violates our sort of principles, but legally they are entitled to. However, a student engaged at a public school, meaning a school run um, uh, on state or federal money, um, not a private school, but a public school is like a state actor, and the government can't restrict your protest me message. The government has to say, um, has to let you either express your message or uh, let you uh, refuse to uh, speak uh, a, a government message. So students doing what Kaepernick did are protected. If their principals try and punish them or kick them off the team, they can sue and win. But Kaepernick, working for a private company, doing the same exact uh, act, in fact, the act that they are inspired by, is not protected. So context is vital to understanding American notions of free speech and, um, and, and the law in general. Right, so we heard, instead of, say, a pornographic magazine, which had a history of, you know, putting in satirical illustrations, if the same headline would have been in probably a national newspaper, then that would have been a completely different story. Yes, absolutely would have lost. 
Um, okay. if, if the New York Times had written an article saying that um, that a Jerry Falwell, you know, new okay. research has shown that Jerry Falwell, you know, he's both a drunk and, you know, lost his virginity to his mother, you know, as a child um, in an outhouse, um, that would be, that would violate actual malice clearly. It would be knowingly false. There would be uh, a reckless disregard for the truth. Even if they said, well, somebody told that to me. I, I read it in Hustler. Um, you know, uh, that would not be protected. And, and, and I think that's, that's a good thing. Right. So now that we're talking about the rights of the press, there's one more very important judgment which needs to be mentioned, and that's New York Times Company versus United States. Yes. Now, in this case, the court held that the government cannot be allowed to pre-censor the press. However, if the information is especially crucial for maintaining national security, should there not be some mechanism to censor its publication by the press? Because, well, as you said, while your speech is protected, you aren't protected from its consequences. So in this case, also, if you publish something which goes against national security interests, you would very well be penalized for it. But now the only difference is the information is already out and then you're punished for it. So instead of that, don't you think that there could be some mechanism to say, you know, censor speech, which, as I said, is especially crucial for national security interests? Uh, well, I, I, I agree with the point you're making, but I, I actually think that uh, we can look to uh, that what's often called the Pentagon Papers uh, decision. We can okay. look to the uh, the New York Times, uh, United States versus the New York Times um, case to actually give us that restriction. So, um, so people focus on, so I, I talk about how Daniel Ellsberg, um, uh, who was actually a, a part of a conservative think tank, um, you know, grows disillusioned um, with uh, the Vietnam War. He releases this uh, top secret, the highest level of security clearance um, in American uh, uh, spycraft um, uh, document, this long history of the, the Vietnam War, previously commissioned by the uh, Defense Secretary McNamara. Um, and he has a hard time getting people to publish it, but he eventually gives it to the New York Times um, they publish it, then the Washington Post um, publishes it, uh, and Nixon um, and his administration uh, seek to um, to stop it. Um, they, they bring uh, what's called an injunction um, to, to literally stop the presses, um, and, and this is a multi-part series coming out from the Times, uh, and they stop the Times from publishing it. Uh, there's a temporary court order that stops the Times, and then there's a temporary uh, court order that, that stops the Washington Post, and then other newspapers are taking it on. And it goes up to the Supreme Court, uh, and the Supreme Court is definitely conflicted. And, and there's a key moment um, at oral argument um, where the lawyer for the New York Times, um, uh, a professor named Bikel, uh, you know, is asked, so you're saying that even if American lives would be lost um, because of this um, publication, that doesn't matter, you're protected by the First Amendment, and that doesn't matter. And the lawyer tries to get out of it, um, and, and I love oral arguments before the Supreme Court, and the, the book has a lot of them, and I uh, I condense them just to the good parts. Um, there's, so, some of it's very procedural, uh, and doesn't make sense if you're not a lawyer, but but the, but the actual fighting over issues, and this is one of those moments that I, I think are, are hey. compelling, very compelling. The, the, the Kel tries to say, well, no, there's no evidence that any American lives will be lost. There's zero evidence of that. And the justice says, I don't care. In theory, are you saying that you have a right to publish this even if American lives will be lost? And he says, well, Your Honor, uh, I have to uh, concede that if there was evidence that American lives would be lost, that no, my sense of, uh, of, uh, of, of preservation of life would trump even the free speech protections, the free press protections of the First Amendment. And people were people were outraged that he said this at argument. The ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a liberal advocacy group, thought it was a tremendous mistake that he had conceded too much and, and that he was going to lose the case for it. But actually, that is what became the standard. People just know that the, um, that the New York Times won and that they were able to publish um, the decision, but actually what the court said was if there is direct, uh, immediate, and irreparable harm uh, to the nation or its people, that then we can restrict. That's just an incredibly tough standard to meet, though. Direct, meaning not like 
maybe something will happen to harm people. No, this will cause harm. Uh, immediate, not a week from now, something like that might happen, um, and irreparable, loss of life. Not just that somebody might be put in danger, but that something that, that can't come back. That's an incredibly challenging uh, standard to meet. People today just sort of assume that it means that you never can um, restrict the press um, from publishing even national security issues, but that's not the standard. The standard does put into place the, um, the concern that you're raising, um, that there would sometimes be um, a, a, a reason to trump even the robust protections uh, of freedom of the press. Um, and uh, and I, I am comfortable with that as long as we remember that that is an enormously difficult uh, standard to meet. Yeah. So then again, you have the case of FCC versus uh, Pacific Star Foundation, where the Supreme Court held that since the content aired by the radio station was indecent but not obscene, the government had a pervading interest to broadcast to regulate such broadcast media. So what exactly is the difference between the words indecent and obscene? Because, uh, you know, to somebody who does not come from a legal field, th they might seem like pretty much the same. So could you please explain the difference? Sure. So, uh, so in this case, I, I, I talked, uh, I began sort of talking about um, Samantha B, who's a political comedian today, who uh, used uh, a vulgar word to describe Ivanka Trump in trying to get her to um, do something to stop her uh, father's, um, the president, former president's, uh, I would say, racist immigration policies. Um, and uh, and the, the question begins sort of how can she use this vulgarity on cable? Um, and, and what limits do we have um, on cursing on television? Um, I'm going to get to your question in a second, but um, so uh, I go back to uh, George Carlin, a political comedian um, from the 60s and 70s, uh, and he had a famous 730 words monologue, um, and, and then a follow-up monologue called 50 words, uh, and they were played on the radio where he goes off on the words that convention had said at that time, you, 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 there was no law about it, but just sort of, it was sort of known that you couldn't say these words on television. And they're all different curse words, which I won't say, um, but they're in the book. And uh, so um, one father complained uh, about driving um, with his son and, and hearing it on the radio, and the FCC for the first time, you know, basically says we have the power to regulate, as you pointed out, indecent but not obscene uh, language. And, and the Supreme Court, for the first time, says that on broadcast television um, and broadcast radio, um, that there is a, the FCC, the, the Federal Communications uh, Commission, which is a government agency, uh, is allowed to regulate, not entirely censor, but can restrict the use of language during certain times of the day, um, basically to protect children. Um, and um, so, uh, so that is still the law today. There's a lot of controversy about that law, and I talk about that in the book, but that's still the law today. You, there, are, there are language that you cannot use um, during between 6 and uh, a.m. and 10 p.m. Uh, on, on television and radio without um, risking a, a significant uh, fine. It can be in the millions of dollars. Um, and that is because that is indecent language, which is um, a very, very murky and unsatisfying, speaking of murky standards, a very murky standard. But, but to, to simplify, um, indecent language it is mostly what we would call um, cursing, for, to, to make it as simple as possible. That would be indecent. So people, the F word, the S word, um, you know, people uh, in America would know these words. Um, so, you know, curses that you might want to not say in front of your grandmother, um, those um, could be found indecent. Obscenity is a much stricter uh, test. Um, it's a multi-part test, um, and uh, you have to look at the word work as a whole. With indecency, it can be just one moment. Uh, there can't be any redeeming um, uh, political, um, uh, literary, artistic, political, or, or scientific um, merit to it. Again, with indecency, it can just be one moment, even in a very serious documentary, the Scorsese documentary about jazz musicians that was, um, uh, had found to have indecent language in it. Um, uh, and so there's a, it's a much difficult, more difficult, um, threshold to meet. Hey. Obscenity is basically, for lack of a better legal term, is, is hardcore pornography. 
really not even Playboy or Penthouse or Hustler, but much more uh, violent or despicable um, pornography. Now, these are all very value judgment laden words. They don't sound um, that legal, and there are there is legal language, but basically, obscenity um, it can be entirely restricted uh, at any time um, by um, by anyone on on cable or on broadcast. Um, child pornography is a form of obscenity. Um, so uh, that kind of extraordinarily graphic uh, material with no um, sort of redeeming qualities um, taken as a whole can be uh, censored at any time. But indecency is generally um, language, cursing, or brief um, incidents of, of nudity, um, genitalia. Uh, uh, essentially, um, or breasts or buttocks, um, uh, can be found to be indecent. It's a very, that's, a, that's an area I, I don't talk about the, I, I briefly talk about the obscenity standard in the book. Hey. It's a very interesting and, and, and complicated area. Um, but for, for people to know, um, simply in this, again, what I'm trying to do in the book is, is that indecency is very brief moments of nudity or even fleeting moments of cursing, um, which can be regulated, um, and obscenity uh, in, in certain contexts, uh, but not censored. Um, and then obscenity uh, is hardcore pornography, uh, really offensive uh, and, and outrageous material um, that can be basically banned at any time. Right. So I find this interesting that in this case, because it was broadcast over the radio, the FCC, you know, uh, imposed restriction on the use of these words. But then you have the case of Snyder v. Phelps, where these words were clearly displayed on placards and banners, which people were holding in the middle of the road. So while it is true that even outrageous or indecent speech is covered under the First Amendment, shouldn't there also be some sort of reasonable restriction to speech that is clearly hateful, especially when it is targeted at minority communities that have been historically marginalized? For instance, in the case of uh, Schneider v. Phelps, there were individuals picketing on public land, raising clearly homophobic slogans and holding placards that contained outrightly offensive slurs against the LGBTQIA plus community. So now, while this may sound like more of a moral consideration, but does such hateful speech even merit protection under the First Amendment? And, you know, adding on to that, over here, in this case, if, say, one of the placards had the effort and there was a child walking by next to the man holding the placard. So wouldn't that also have an impact on his mind? The same impact which it would have if he had listened to it, say, on the radio. Well, you, you raised two very important and, and, and one easy and one difficult issue. The, the easy issue um, is that there, although there is no right to curse on broadcast radio or television, uh, there is a right to curse in public. Um, and, and that's another one of the chapters in the book that I talk about, Cohen versus California. A man wrote um, on his jacket, F the draft during the Vietnam War. I think people can assume what the curse word was. Um, and uh, But he wrote it out. Uh, he had it on and he was fine. Uh, and it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and they said, uh, you know, beautiful decision, uh, the court, a beautiful line. The court says, one man's vulgarity is another man's lyric. And in other words, we can't sort of censor public expressions of anger. There is a First Amendment and free speech right to express your message how you choose. And that expression can even include curse words. So you're exactly right. There's a contradiction. You are allowed to curse in public, um, but you are not even in a courthouse, uh, but you're not allowed uh, to curse on television. And, and the not entirely satisfying answer uh, for why that's true is Justice Stevens says that um, uh, in, his, in his specific decision that um, that um, cursing on the radio or television because you uh, have it in your home or your car um, and you don't know um, you don't know what to expect that that's uh, it's different than sort of books or movies and stuff that it's like an assault that comes at you um, unexpected so you could say being on the street yes. that, that's right in your own private space okay. exactly so in your own private space, all of a sudden you're assaulted. You can't sort of, you don't have time to, to turn a blind eye. And that's why that's different. Whereas once you sort of go into public, you have to sort of take what you get. People okay. are in public. They have, it's there. We're sharing the space together. Okay. So that's the easy part. The hard part um, is the very important and challenging question that you raise about hate speech. And this is um, one area that I think uh, international uh uh, viewers and listeners um, will will find um, the American law extraordinarily different 
uh, than, than the European okay. and other parts of the world uh, model. Um, so uh, one of the chapters in the book is explicitly, as you were describing, explicitly about hate speech. Uh, and it begins um, with uh, Nazis marching in, in Charlottesville at the infamous Unite the Right rally um, and with their you know, racist and anti-Semitic uh, chants. And I, I'm a Jewish person and uh, I, I found this, you know, one of the most hateful things to uh, watch on television um, in my lifetime. Um, so I, I, am, I am very sensitive um, to uh, the concern that um, why can't, okay, we have a lot of free speech protections, but why can't we just, but we also have some limits on free speech and why can't this be one of the areas where we have limits? And that is not what the law is in this country. So let me explain what the law is for a moment and then we can talk about how it compares to uh, other models. Um, so in this case where you talk about the Westboro Baptist Church, this, this uh, hateful church that uh, used to protest outside of military funerals saying that um, that any American death, um, uh, you know, abroad um, was God's punishment for America's, in their mind, uh, too great a tolerance of LGBTQ plus rights, um, and and had these hateful anti-Catholic, uh, anti-gay um, protests on public land outside of this uh, military funeral for this man's son. And he tries to see them, again, for intentional emotional distress, sort of like Falwell. Um, and, and it goes up to the Supreme Court and, and Justice Roberts, who's you know a, a noted conservative, perhaps um, not Chief Justice Roberts, um, the, the leader of, of the current Supreme Court, um, uh, says that at its bedrock, um, if the First Amendment means anything, it means that we can't punish speakers um, who are speaking on public land about a matter of pri uh, public concern uh, and not physically interfering um, with anyone. Um, we can't re restrict those speakers or punish those speakers just because their message is so hateful. And he goes on to say that, you know, words can wound. Words really do um, have um, a, a level of emotional violence attached to them, um, but that the First Amendment does not protect, uh, excuse me, the First Amendment even protects free speech rights in America, even um, protect hateful speech. And the reason behind that, he and others have argued, uh, is because otherwise, who decides? Who decides um, what um, hateful language is protected and, and what isn't? You know, during, uh, after the Unite the Right rally, you know, former President Trump, um, you know, famously said that there were good people on both sides, it's somehow equating uh, anti-racist protesters with with neo-Nazis and, and actual Nazis. Um, um, and um, I, I think many liberals in America would not want uh, Trump deciding um, what what language is counted as hate. Um, and perhaps conservatives uh, wouldn't want the Biden-Harris administration um, to make uh, those judgments. But this is very different than the European model. Um, most of, uh, and, and that's the the, the foreign law that I know a little bit about, but other parts of the world too, as well as uh, Africa and Asia, um, uh, there, are, there are hate speech restrictions. Um, for example, in Germany and other places, um, uh, Holocaust denial is outlawed, or use of uh, swastikas um, are, are outlawed. Um, uh, and um, we have very different approaches. So I would say um, that... Um, uh, for people who are very interested in this area, um, there's a wonderful book called Hate, Why We Should Fight It with Free Speech, Not Censorship by Professor Nadine Strassen, who used to be the uh, president of the ACLU, and she spends a lot of time sort of comparing um, international hate speech laws um, with uh, their impact. And, and one of the disturbing um, uh, things that she raises from research uh, is that often those laws that are that are in theory designed to protect um, religious or, or other uh, minorities um, are used actually to um, persecute them. Um, that, um, that they're often turned on people. When somebody says this uh, speaker is homophobic, all of a sudden their uh, a critique of somebody as homophobic um, is, is being uh, uh, criminalized uh, as, as hate speech. Um, so, um, it, there are very different approaches. Uh, the international model, we can call it, um, says uh, we are in a, a, a multiracial and multi-ethnic and diverse society. Um, if there's a history of, of, of persecution of a, a certain type of uh, 
group of people, we should be able to restrict um, attack, verbal attacks, not physical attacks, because that's already uh, covered in America, but, but verbal um, criticisms of, of those people. And the American model is all speech um, is protected, even hateful speech, from restriction by the government. Right. Right. And, and, and I don't want to seem like I'm dodging the, the question. I think people can glean what my, yeah. um, my, my perspective is, but I, I will state it outright that um, even though I find this the most troubling element of, uh, of, of First Amendment law, of free speech law, on balance, uh, I, I, do, um, I do agree with the American approach. I, I do worry about who decides. I worry that, um, uh, that in, internationally it has not been either enormously effective in eliminating hate, um, nor, uh, and it seems like it has also been used uh, to persecute the very groups it's designed to protect. So I, I think both as a theoretical question as well as a practical question, I, I, I'm more inclined toward the American model, but this is the one area in, in free speech law where I'm, I'm conflicted and I definitely respect um, other people's point of view in, in that area. It's a very tough call. Right. So, apart from this book, you also recently released a non-fiction graphic novel called The Free Speech Handbook, which is essentially a comic book, which, um, could you like flip through the pages and maybe... Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, keep, yeah, I'll flip while you talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, so could you just tell us more about that? So, essentially, it's a comic book which would tell you about the First Amendment rights. So it's informative, but it's fun. So, uh, yeah, could you tell us about that? Yeah, thank you. So um, uh, when I was working on the fight for free speech, I was lucky enough um, to have the opportunity to have this companion um, nonfiction graphic novel come out uh, from uh, and be part of an amazing series of civics-oriented uh, graphic novels. So um, nonfiction books told in comic book form uh, about, um, about government and political issues. Um, and I have an incredible um, partner, the artist Mike Cavallero, uh, uh, an Eisner-nominated uh, graphic novelist uh, and artist. Um, and together, um, we sort of transformed the fight for free speech into this even shorter, I, I condensed it even yeah. more uh, with Mike's help, um, book filled with pictures. Um, and, and I find it um, really exciting for a couple reasons. Um, one um, is that, you know, my goal is to explain um, free speech law to people sort of in any sort of uh, way that they want to approach it. Um, and so you can either read, um, uh, hopefully, an engaging um, a traditional book, um, or for uh, junior high school in America, so teens um, and high school students, um, this is uh, another approach. Plus, as a, an adult, I love uh, reading nonfiction graphic novels. Um, there's a, a brilliant um, series of uh, memoir books by uh, the late uh, uh, Congressperson John Lewis about his civil rights um a journey um, where I learned a tremendous amount uh, about his uh, struggle and, and, and his wisdom. Um, and I have, you know, I could read uh, biographies about him, but, um, but, but the graphic novel form is so compelling. Um, and, but additionally, so much of our free speech rights are actually visual um, rights. So we say free speech, but we're really talking about free expression. Um, and many of the cases I talk about in both books uh, involve visual speech. So we have um, black armbands to protest uh, the Vietnam War. We have somebody writing on his jacket um, F the draft. Uh, we have Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. Um, we have a parody visual ad um, in, in Hustler. And um, all of these sort of free expression rights, um, I think, are incredibly um, exciting to see um, in a graphic novel form. Um, the other book has no pictures, um, and, and this book is uh, filled with art. Um, and then the last thing that the, uh, the Fight for Free Speech, um, excuse me, that Free Speech Handbook, the graphic novel does, um, is that it visualizes many of the metaphors um, that we've been talking about. So when we talk about um, the marketplace of ideas, uh, for people who are watching this on video, uh, I'm showing the uh, incredible the coin. Yeah. It's a literal marketplace where people are selling fiction, reality, facts. Um, there's a picture of actually my son who's wearing an idea t-shirt. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and I think that once you start seeing, and, and there's a, a number of ways in which uh, Mike Cavallaro um, visualizes sort of legal concepts. And I think the power of sort of seeing that um, with the explanation from my text 
Uh, I actually think it can give people an even greater uh, appreciation and understanding of some very abstract concepts um, in the law. So I think it's an exciting companion, um, and uh, I hope people uh, check out both books, uh, both The Fight for Free Speech and Free Speech Handbook. Right, and also in this book, there's so much attention to detail because, you know, as you said, there's like a literal marketplace and there's so much graphic representation of, you know, all of these ideas. So I'm just very curious, how much time did this entire process take of making uh, this um, graphic novel? Yeah, so it took basically, it took me about a year to write the book and it took about uh, about a year to, a little bit less, um, to adapt it. Mike is an, a, incredibly uh, talented. Uh, he basically took my um, my text uh, and then said, all right, let me, let me condense this and visualize it. Let me know what you think. And so he would send me a chapter um, and it was always remarkably close to what I wanted, even more than I, I, I could imagine. And I would find little, you know, we need to add in one sentence here because this is a key concept. Um, so, um, and every now and then I'd be like, oh, you're tipping the scales of justice the wrong way. Like, it's actually about liberty, not, um, you know, not unity. Um, okay. But, uh, so it was uh, an incredible collaboration. He's an immensely uh, talented artist, and I encourage people to uh, check out uh, his fiction graphic novels. Um, he has a great children's series called Nico Bravo. Um, but it was, a, it was about a, a year working together uh, to adapt the book. Right. So Ian, thank you so much for being here today. This has been a really insightful conversation. And I'm sure after uh, watching this interview, there's going to be readers who would definitely want to go get their copies of both of these books. And I am really looking forward to reading um, the graphic novel, which I would very soon. But uh, having read the first book, I would definitely recommend anyone who's interested in free speech or not just that, anyone who's interested in, you know, reading about stories of individuals who fought for their rights all the way to the Supreme Court, it's the best pick for you. So, yeah, thank you so much, Ian, for being here today. Thank you for the smart questions, this really engaging dialogue. Uh, and if people want to find out more uh, about my books or uh, engage with me directly, uh, they can go to either of the book's websites. Um, there's the fightforfreespeech.com uh, is the uh, website. Uh, for this book um, and the text uh, and free speech handbook, uh, the graphic novel is freespeechhandbook.com and people can follow me directly on social uh, at freespeechbook. Um, and I not only talk about my books, but I also try and curate um, feed about important uh, American and, and international issues uh, about free expression. So uh, thank you so much for having me. And I really uh, appreciate your kind words about the books. Thank you so much.